ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the sixth annual philosophy lecture. Philosophy sharing during this year has been working very hard to offer a space for philosophical debate in our society, both in Malta and in Gozo. How do we do that? At least in three ways. First, with a monthly talk. Every month we invite a talker and he or she presents a subject and then it follows an open discussion. Second, with different courses led by specialists that deal with a philosophical question during few sessions. And third, with a magazine share that, as you might know, we publish three times a year. Actually, I should add a fourth leg here, because in Gozo we have started what we call the pizza meeting. It's not about food. It simply means that we meet up regularly to discuss or to talk about the text of a philosopher that we are interested in, and we do it in an informal atmosphere. I wish we could add more legs or wings to this project in order to develop and to continue learning about this mystery called life. So if you would like to become a member of this team with different nationalities and backgrounds, you are more than welcome and you can do it at the end of the talk. Finally, let me encourage you to take part in the Gozo outing next Saturday, 24th of March, because it will be fun and we will show you some secrets of the island of Gozo. You can find more information in our web. Now, Dr. Max Casar, the Director of Philosophy Sharing Malta, will introduce our talker, Professor Baldacchino. Thank you and welcome. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor and my pleasure to present this evening our distinguished guest for the sixth annual Philosophy Sharing Foundation Lecture, Professor Dr. John Baldacchino. Professor Baldacchino is the director of the Arts Institute of the University of Madison, Wisconsin, where he is also a professor of arts education. Prior to medicine, he was Professorial Chair of Arts Education at the University of Dundee in Scotland. He has served as Associate Dean and Full Professor of Arts Pedagogy at the Graduate School, Falmouth University, United Kingdom. As Associate Professor of Art and Arts Education at Columbia University's Teachers College in New York, Reader in Critical Theory and Contextual Studies at Gray's School of Art, the Robert Golden University, Scotland and Lecturer of Arts Education and Cultural Studies at the University of Warwick, England. As an academic, Professor Badakino specializes in art, philosophy, politics and education. While his academic work is always contextualized by the arts, it is framed within a comprehensive context in terms of engaging with the contemporary arts within an argon that articulates a politics of aesthetics that is formative and radically democratic. Doing research as a generative activity that reflects studio practice-based methods and regarding the role of the academic as an opportunity to enhance democracy as a creative state of affairs that emerges from the ever-changing horizon of a pragmatic understanding of change and constant reform. As an artist, Baldacchino considers his engagement with the visual arts as having three venues, avenues, studio, practice, theoretical research, and teaching. In his studio practice, he mainly works in two-dimensional media, although in his artistic education, he specializes in both painting and sculpture. His studio interests extend to publishing, typography, and graphic design. As a graphic designer, he designed and illustrated a series of Italian textbooks children's Italian readers, and cover design and layout and page setting of several academic books. He also contributed as a freelance political cartoonist in weekly and monthly newspapers and magazines. He exhibited in solo and collective shows in the UK, Europe, 
the United States and Asia, and he mostly works in two-dimensional mixed media. Professor Baldacchino is the author of numerous refereed and journalistic articles in academic and political journals. Between 1983 and 1990, he regularly published journalistic articles and critical essays in political journals and newspapers language, and was also a graphic artist and political cartoonist, contributing work on a weekly basis. More recently, he has resumed writing on civil issues and political reform, though his focus remains on academic writing. He is the author of the following books, Post-Marxist Marxism, Questioning the Answer, Eases of Utopia, Arts Fact Returned, Avant, Nostalgia, An Excuse to Pause, Education, Beyond Education, Self and the Imaginary, and Maxine Green's Philosophy, and more yet. He is currently working on a number of books, which include the Wiley Blackwell's Encyclopedia of Art and Design Education, Volume 1, Philosophy and History of Art Education, by Wiley Blackwell's, and the book, Educing Ivan Illich, Education Without Education, edited by Peter Lang. Professor Baldacchino is a graduate of the University of Malta. He was in the Faculty of Education between 1991 between 1984 and 1989, and then he continued his postgraduate education in Warwick, England, where he obtained a Master's of Education in Aesthetics, Critical Theory, and Mediterranean Studies, and a Doctorate in Philosophy from the same university, again in these areas. I would like to invite Professor Baldacchino to give us his lecture this evening, entitled Beatified Lying, Make Belief and Truthfulness in the Democratic Imaginary. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. I normally am much more kind of at ease when I talk and uh, gesticulate and whatever, but um, on this one I think I let myself into a bit of a, of a difficult uh, <laughs> series of issues, so I would love to, you know, I have to read parts of this um, in order to make sure that uh, I don't get it wrong. So, I mean, knowing that you're uh, philosophy people, I have to be very careful. So, so anyway, um, thanks for the, uh, the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm really pleased to see so many colleagues and uh, friends, old friends of mine, and also, you know, uh, new friends, and um, I'm really glad to be here in Malta to, uh, to give this lecture. So, I mean, I hope I'm not missing anyone, and uh, that's why I'm not mentioning anyone, but I'm very, very grateful for the uh, Philosophy Sharing Society for inviting me. Um, so, without further ado, I would like to start. Um, I'm going to use PowerPoint my, mainly because probably it's my pedagogical kind of instincts, and, uh, but also because I will be quoting some stuff which I would love to kind of put there for you to read. And knowing that I tend to speak very fast, um, I don't want you to kind of miss some of the important aspects which I'm referring to. Before I start, I would like to kind of... Um, Charles... Um, only a couple of weeks ago, he did tell me that he was going to come here and uh, listen to this lecture. Unfortunately, um, he changed his mind and uh, he went to the promised land. So, I want to dedicate this um, this lecture to, to him. I don't know whether you know this, maybe you read my uh, tribute to him in the Times, but he was uh, one of the uh, those people who actually acted as mentor back when I was... 19 basically, so he always encouraged me to write um, and to, to express myself if you like, and he published a lot of stuff by myself, which was probably risky for him, but anyway. So um, I salute uh, Charles, and he's always going to be with us. Okay, I just wanted to start with this, and uh, just to sort of I would return to these two, two um, quotes from, uh, from the Talmud. One of the reasons I ended up quoting the Talmud is that when, uh, when I started looking at this and doing a lot of research, I found actually that the whole idea of the lie in philosophy has quite a kind of uh, very long trajectory in terms of, of uh, philosophical thinking. 
Um, but then, the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to kind of shift it away from this kind of analytical um, discussion of, of what is a lie. And I wanted to move it more into the idea of the, the political, the polis, the community. And um, given that we have a liberal democratic tradition, one of the methodologies which is very useful is to get out of those kind of traditions and look at it from the outside. And this, this, this really helped. Hopefully, it will become clear why I'm doing this. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll start reading this, and hopefully I won't uh, bore you. This lecture will discuss the relationship between aesthetic representation and the loss of virtuous deception in the democratic political imaginary. And by making reference to what I'm calling beatified lies, I want to draw attention to a democratic process whose character of diversity dissent and contradiction has been domesticated. I will argue that democracy's dialectic is suppressed by a structure of vested interests whose main objective is that of eclipsing politics. This eclipsing is a consequence of a dogmatic foundational approach that upholds a specific socioeconomic order. Closer to home, especially in southern Europe, politics have been eclipsed by how the European Union, for example, treats those economies which fall out of line. This has encouraged further distortions of political discourse where the reactionary right is taking advantage of the vacuum that is left behind by the politics of the center. Reactionaries seem to think that they now have the green light to ignore and threaten the democratic objectives of diversity and conviviality. Now, when the political is eclipsed, democracy fails to function as a form of associated living. It fails to offer a possible horizon of conviviality. And instead, what we now call democracy is often reduced to a procedure which is openly manipulated and where the multiple character of the democratic conversation is distorted. One consequence of this distortion is evident in an increasing inability to converse, which comes from a suppression of dialogue and consequently by how a language game, such as that of lying, has been selectively killed and beatified. Now, what do I mean by killing and, and the subsequent beatification of the lie? Now, in this paper, I will argue that, as a language game, the lie is an integral part of political discourse within a democratic agon. However, for this agon, for this space of arguing, uh, to function, the multiple character of democratic expression must be affirmed in all its nuances. Yet, in its current state, democracy is agon, has been hollowed out. In the vacuum that ensued, we are left with a form of representation that has been hijacked by a neoliberal parasitic discourse. And by the way, by neoliberal, I don't mean the air of liberalism. I argue that neoliberalism actually goes against neoliberalism. And this, this has also been argued even in the 1930s by John Dewey, actually, who, who has written several books on this issue. He didn't call, he didn't call it neoliberalism, he called it pseudo-liberalism, but I mean, there are very interesting parallels there. So, symptoms of this condition are found in what Gillian Rose, the philosopher, once called the inseparability between fascism and representation. There's a wonderful book by Gillian Rose, which was published posthumously, called Morning Becomes the Law, where she has several uh, interesting arguments about that. Anyway, not without irony, this is reinforced by actions of dissent, which in the neoliberal condition are turned onto themselves because they are trapped in a number of aporias. These aporias, these closed gates, which could stifle the contradiction itself, have effectively co-opted dissent into an aesthetic representation that appears radical, but which ultimately fails to dent the establishment. But before I move on, I want to clarify two things. First thing is that this lecture is not about Maltese politics, even though we are a Malta and I'm addressing a Maltese, broadly Maltese audience, I am not looking at that. Actually, what I'm looking at is um, the preoccupation which pushed us into a sort of qualunquismo, a kind of quietism, where in this case, it's not that the voters say, okay, I will just vote anyone because I don't care about what they say as long as I can kind of gain what I want, but actually where the qualunquismo, the quietism, is happening in the virtual identity, virtual sameness of political parties. They all become the same thing. So, secondly, the lecture is not a discussion of the lie per se, 
Anyone researches, or anyone who researches the literature about lying will find an abundance of works, papers, books, and treaties about the lie. In the history of philosophy, lying is a major thing. St. Augustine, to cite just one prominent philosopher, wrote not one, but two treaties on lying. Kant was engrossed by the problem of lying, while much more recently, a number of books are written with specific events of lying in mind. Actually, the top of the charts still is Bill Clinton's claim that he had no sexual relationship with that woman. And uh, you'll find that a lot of books actually online, which are mainly, some of them are very analytical in terms of analytical philosophy, they start with this thing. Was Bill Clinton lying and what does that mean? Now, I suspect that now the markets for books online will be rife. It will be widening with the advent of Donald Trump's claim on so-called fake news and the bizarre turn of events which, in part, are a symptom of the representational degeneration of politics. So, philosophy could help us find a distinctive, a discursive opportunity to understand how aesthetic representation relates to the beatification of lying. However, before we discuss the lie, we need to explain what is meant by representation, and more so, aesthetic representation. I understand representation at least two ways. The first is an act of presenting a game, which means that we construct imaginaries by continuously visiting and revisiting, learning and unlearning the world. By representation, we are not simply claiming one form of presenting that we assume to be truthful. Rather, in our forms of representation, we seek to make sense of the world. And we also try to understand what the world means for us as individuals and as members of society. This meaning is therefore negotiated. It confirms the relationship between our immediate forms of existence and the multiple forms of mediation by which we construct our realities. Representation is a way of knowing the world, understood not simply as an epistemology, which as you know is a hierarchy of knowledge, but from a gnoseological viewpoint. Whereas you know, gnoseology has to do with how we assert our being as knowledge. So there is this whole relationship between an ontological aspect of knowledge in an osseological point of view. Secondly, there is what the Germans call Forschung. I apologize for my, uh, <laughs> for my pronunciation. Some translate this as a representational form of research. In other words, through representing the world, we also seek in order to find the world. This research is by no means re reserved to the experts. Indeed, the hegemony of specialization of inheritances in epistemology has become a dominant force in how representation becomes a form of instrumentalized, instrumentalized knowledge. However, we need to resist this approach by asserting a concept of knowing that is active and thereby sustained by a sense of autonomy. Autonomy implies multiplicity. In recognizing the multiple character of representation, we realize that in our representation of the world, we are both showing and finding ourselves as a society and as a polis. This means that as a society, we must creatively embrace politics as an experiment. I take this notion of experimentation very seriously, and on this I do subscribe very strongly with John Dewey's argument for democracy as a continuous experiment. Through experimentation, we gain the power and claim the right to look for and indeed find what comes from the intrinsic value of representational practice. Here, representation becomes an occasion for thinking and dialoguing. In aesthetic terms, it is an occasion for doing and making. I would add that representation must remain intrinsic to how we unlearn by dint of what we never expected, let alone set out to find. Now, keeping both meanings of representation in mind, we now turn to the lie. By focusing on the notion of lying, and indeed speaking of a beatified form, of lying within the political imaginary, I will show how the lie is beatified not simply by those who lie, but by the fact that, is a specific, that a specific lie, that of liberal and social democracy, has been eliminated from the political imaginary. And I need to kind of you know, clarify this because we need to kind of think about this sort of inside out. It's a bit like kind of a dialectic in terms that sometimes we assume that the lie is the wrong thing, and also by saying that liberal and social democrats were lying, you might think that I'm saying that they were doing the wrong thing. You need to go beyond this kind of good and evil situation here. There is a kind of much more of a relational situation going on, which might begin to explain what I'm trying to say here. 
If I fail, that's my fault. So, <laughs> however, as survivors of the death of the lie, as a democratic language game, we must realize that we are past the stage of mourning. This is because, in the wake of the lie's demise, mourning has become de facto a grammar that juxtaposes itself against what we claim to have changed the jure in law. Now, just to give you an example, while we claim progress gained in law, this does not correspond with the political practices of everyday life. On a closer look, it is evident that while we seem to have made great strides in civil and other rights, and we still claim to have freedom of expression and all that comes with it, on the ground we are seeing the opposite. And you could kind of talk about this in terms, for example, of how even though um, segregation in America has been kind of abolished for a long, long time, you still have racism there. And you, people still kind of ask, what, what on earth is going on? How does this kind of work? But also you could apply it to all sorts of other situations. So racial hatred, misogyny, and homophobia are growing exponentially, while free speech is often used as an excuse for one narrative to intimidate another one. In other words, with the suppression of multiplicity, we have lost our ability to communicate. And this is where it gets really problematic. And more so, we cannot even find a viable way of using disagreement as a basis for democratic conversation. I remind you of Jacques Rancière's book on uh, democracy called Disagreement, or translated in English uh, as Disagreement, where actually the, the whole idea of the disagreement is crucial to democracy. If we disagree, that's good. You know, if we fail to disagree, then there's a problem. Because if we don't use this agreement in order to be able to push the agon of democracy, then we have a problem. So, how does lying come into all this? In his Minima Moralia, and this is the bit that really prompted me to propose to Father Mark, actually, the, uh, the idea of this lecture. Um, in his Minima Moralia, Theodor Dorno states that the lie, once a liberal means of communication, has today become one of the techniques of insolence, enabling each individual to spread around him the glacial atmosphere in whose shelter he can thrive. And I'm leaving it there for a while so that you can kind of, you know, go through that. Now, I would argue that the lie which Adorno alludes to has died with liberalism itself. What is posing as a lie in the vacuum left by liberalism is the same parasitic condition by which a neoliberal articulation of democracy transforms political lying into a hollow, hollow ritual. It is a ritual that both liberal and social democracies partake of. This is best symbolized by how Democrats and Republicans in the United States and the socialist and popular parties in the European Union continue to indulge in their dance macabre while racists and neo-fascists take over the polity. In this context, Adorno was prescient. When the liberal means of communication, which so well served liberal and social democrats, becomes a ghost, then we can see how the lie, politically speaking, becomes a discourse that cannot even keep up a straight face when it appeals to truth. At the same time, the lie also operates on the level of everyday living, living which is hardly a haven away from the rituals of a shelled-out democracy. Here, the shame, the shame of the lie becomes itself an object of ridicule, indeed a sham which allows the representational efforts of the classic liberal lie to make a fool of everyone. The practice of lying has lost its honesty. It has become a means by which its raison d'etre cannot even claim legitimation. In terms of both the law and everyday life, the incongruence between what we legislate and what we practice to save a card democracy is reduced to its opposite in the actuality of living, both within the polis and in the domestic realms of the quotidian of everyday living. So, what does this mean in terms of the relationship between what is posed as true and what is represented as the truth that one couldn't even afford to represent a lie? Adorno comments, Adorno's comments recall my personal experience of Brexit and the election of Donald Trump in 2016. For my, for my sins, actually, I was in Britain when there was Brexit, referendum. Uh, I even voted there, obviously against Brexit. But then I go to America, a new job and everything, and find myself uh, having to vote against Trump. And, but in both cases, it was a very strange situation because actually when this happened, people were kind of really confused, not because they weren't expecting it to happen, but actually because some people, including myself, we thought it was going to happen. 
but we couldn't believe it would happen because partly we knew that the lying normally within the democratic context operates in different ways, but this one was totally different. So, incidentally, as I was completing this lecture, I just woke up then, I can't remember when, last week or something like that, I woke up to the prospect of Matteo Salvini becoming the Italian Prime Minister, so here you are. So, these events are examples of how the lie, which Adorno describes as once a liberal means of communication, lost its ability to communicate. Now, I, I, I owe you an explanation here. I am aware that this statement might raise eyebrows, as some would insist that, on the contrary, lying is in the political imaginary is prevailing. But this is where politics is being misread, and where a philosophical approach might help us understand how, without the dynamic of the lie that communicates, without the lie as a language game, the prospect of more reactionary politics is increasing. In being beatified, and therefore in being removed from the spheres of existence and what ensues is the aporia of truth, the lie was eliminated from political representation. Contrary to what many have hastily argued, the lie has nothing to do with fake news. The term fake news is symptomatic of how the lie fails to communicate. It confirms how the liberal means of communication has been suppressed, Neoliberalism is not a result of liberalism, nor is it a new reiteration of liberalism. We need to forget that. Otherwise, we're going to get stuck even with democracy itself. Rather, the lie has been eliminated by its becoming a term of immediacy, as it was substituted by the neoliberal accommodation of fake news. We must bear in mind that fake news in itself pertains to neither truth nor falsehood. Those who claim that fake news is some new form of lying are mistaking the symptom for the malady. Fake news is a mechanism that alienates us from the problematic of the political semiotics by which the lie played a major role in the liberal and social democracies. And hopefully I showed that. In both Brexit and the US presidential elections, what could see, perhaps with a degree of hindsight, that the death of the liberal lie was there from the start. There, political discourse did not follow the usual parameters. Nothing appeared predictable. There was no agreement upon the rules on which the discourse of the political contest have hitherto evolved. This wasn't even a new game. It was a match played without rules. Democracy was at the mercy of anti-politics. The anti-political approach taken by both by the Brexit and Trump campaigns prevailed, not because, as some claimed, people lost faith in the political game, but because those who entered the political scene only regarded democracy as a means to legitimize their anti-democratic approach. Now let me explain what I mean by this. Here we have a situation where the language game of lying is thrown out of kilter. In other words, lying stops from being a language game, and thereby it operates outside the space within which the game was meant to be played. So you don't only throw out the referee, but also you play it outside the pitch. Politically speaking, and in terms of the agreements, agreements on which the democratic contest is based, there is an expectation of a dialectic that would seek to put in front of the electorate, electorate a narrative which, within what Wittgenstein has called the multiplicity of language games, the contest of democracy is inclusive of all divergent opinions as played on the grounds of democracy itself. Yet here we had a contest where those who reject democracy have claimed to be playing on democratic rules. Their sense of winning meant that of scuppering what democracy implicitly means. Let us not forget that democracy is intended to be a space where, in their multiplicity, some narratives would prevail. However, this does not mean that the multiplicity is eliminated. To eliminate this multiplicity would mean eliminating democracy itself. Yet in this case, the winner not only got all, but the dialectic was stalled, indeed avoided, and the multiplicity was never kept in view. Democracy's experiment, its dialectic, was taken apart and simply ignored. Lies are meant to communicate. In whichever way the lie features in politics, such a language game needs to retain a place in the communicative rules of democracy. It is also important to qualify such lies within the language game as a function of democracy, and therefore as part of the rules upon which we agree when embarking on the democratic contest. Wittgenstein regards language game as forms of life, or language games as forms of life. The speaking of language, he says, is part of an activity, a form, or a form of life. Language games contribute to and form part of an agreed way of speaking 
that would ultimately communicate what it means. When Adorno calls the lie as a liberal form of communication, this is in the context in which I would put it in. The lie in the liberal and social democratic contexts has evolved as part of the learned ways of the democratic polity. There is some debate on whether Wittgenstein was right in calling the lie a language game. John Searle disagrees with him. He argues that lying should not be regarded as a language game because, I quote, lying consists in violating one of the regulative rules on the performance of speech acts. Close quote. In his philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein remarks, in parentheses, that lying is a language game that needs to be learned. And this is really fascinating for me, at least, because of the whole issue of learning, like any other one. So he's implying that language games are learned. Searle states that to learn how to violate the rules would go against the efficacy of the rule itself. So you can see the dilemma here. Now, I would argue that in the context of a democratic game, lying could only make sense as a language game, especially when language games are learned. The implication of a learned speech act does not imply a given, but a specific circumstance where one learns to do so-and-so for a reason. And we have to avoid the foundation as temptation here, you know. I mean, just as Dewey says, these things, we, we evolve them by dint of our being together, by dint of being a society. This is why language games are also unlearned. And it would be the linguistic circumstance itself, which in this case is the open-endedness of democracy, or at least how we want democracy to be, at least I hope we do, that would determine how a language game, such as lying, is bound to function. More so, describing the lie as a language game that here emerges within the context of the democratic agon, one could argue that the experience of lying is not limited simply to someone's own experience, but bears heavily on how lying operates on a wide horizon. The lie is a language game because when we lie, we do so to each other and not just to ourselves. This is why we often find ourselves unlearning such language games given that expectations often turn out to be lies, which means that lies as language games are continuously being substituted by various forms of lying and other forms of truthfulness. Remember that there is also the language game of truthfulness, so we're not just talking about the language game of lying here, but we're also talking about a whole multiplicity of languages. And by the way, the art is not just there to, de to, to decorate things. And there is a meaning to it, as you know, with Manzoni's piece. Uh, there's something interesting there. He was not lying, by the way. It's true. Apparently, they opened those ten tins and they found what he was saying. So it's, it fulfills the... <laughs> anyway. In a way, one could say that there is no truthfulness without lying and vice versa. The continuous exchange between truthfulness and lying forms an essential part of the dialogical nature of democracy. And once this element is taken away, conversations become impossible. Why should I question you if I know that you are not lying? Imagine if our politicians in our beloved places, uh, they treated each other like that. And they say, oh, no, they're not lying. You know, we can't. So what, what, we wouldn't even have need a parliament. Perhaps. Now, I don't know whether you remember that film, The Invention of Lying, in 2009, with Ricky Gervais, uh, which was quite an interesting one, because the elimination of the human capacity to lie is explored in all its extents. So in that film, and if you watch it, I don't want to you know, ruin it for you, um, people were not able to lie at all. But one of them, he realized that genetically he could lie, and suddenly everything changed. And I can tell you that one I remember, I remember that very well that film being, I was being asked by a student when I taught in New York, and she was a Southern student, and she told me whether I was disturbed by the film, and she admitted that she found the whole thing problematic for very religious reasons, and she was really kind of, you know, very disturbed by it. Because the whole thing has also implications in terms of religion and how you lie about things and whatever. So anyway, here I do not want to digress, but in the context of the role of what we utter, believe, state, communicate, whatever their truth value may well be, is an amalgam of what we say. What is said remains within the agon of language. In fact, it cannot happen outside, because language games are forms of the same life by which we play our roles as rational and free beings. This is why Wittgenstein also argues that these games must be kept in view in their entire multiplicity. Without a view of the multiplicity of language games, the Agon loses its ability to be both political and less so 
democratic. To keep the line and other language games out of the multiplicity would spell the end of a democratic polity as we know it. Now, now I want to move to another aspect of this, which has to do with interpretation. If there are no lines in the democratic process, democracy will be limited to what in semiotics is called the first level of signification, that of a language object. As I will explain shortly, the first level of signification is a mechanism that utters the world in its literal form. If our la political language remained only at this level of signification, its claim to truthfulness would need to be limited to a series of statements that do not accept further interpretation. Because what they say is what you get. It will be a literal level of speaking that forbids the right to interpret what is being said other than what it claims to state. I'll give you an example. At this level of signification, a red rose, and here I'm referring to Bart, so those who read his essay, they know what I'm talking about. Um, a red rose at this first level of signification is just a type of flower, which we agree to be a rose and whose color is red. So it's not carnation, it's not a daisy, it's a rose, and it's also red. That's it. There's no way of claiming that it represents love, as most red roses do, or it is a political symbol of socialist parties, or anything other than a red rose. No, it's just a red rose. Don't, don't give it any form of interpretation. Attempting to interpret it would mean that there is a possibility of lying, and that is not allowed at this level, which is where it is not the lie that is fake, but the attempt to eliminate the lie, and with it, any autonom autonomous way of interpreting what one says. Without this multiplicity of all possible language games, democracy is shelled out of its hermeneutic possibilities, and this is important, because hermeneutic possibilities are open-ended, and this is what they give us, in my opinion, a democratic um, possibilities. This may sound too crude, but there are moments when this is becoming evident, at least in how opposed opinions do not con concede that they are in fact opinions and that there are other ways of representing the world. So often we have a fight over representation, say my representation or my interpretation is better than yours, and actually it's, it, it is the truth, the only truth. You know, we know that in religion, for example. As we are witnessing an anomalous Brexit process and the tragic farce evolving in the White House, those who claim that the numbers legitimize the result democratically know very well this is just a veiled excuse for the legitimation of a process that was systematically derailed. Now here, and this is important, I do not mean to dismiss a close result as being undemocratic. I'm not just being a baby here and saying, no, they won, so we shouldn't accept that. We know that normally, when there is an error result, what follows is that the democratic process makes up for it. Especially when successfully a country comes together and recognizes that opinion is split and there needs to be more bridging across the divide. There is a very practical reason for this by the assumptions that we make, indeed by the language games that we play, which include the lies which we by which we communicate, the political objective is to sustain the democratic process itself. If we lose sight of this and we simply regard democracy as being equivalent to a football match, then we are losing sight of what democracy really means. Yet in both Brexit and Trump's presidency, this was exactly the reply which one got whenever someone objected to how democracy is being undermined. Perhaps the best example of how the divide became even wider and how this distortion of democracy made matters worse is found in how when Theresa May called an early election and the Tories were trashed, only to be kept in power by a sheer number of difference added on by the far-right Ulster Unionists, who actually, as you know, you know, have a very different kind of uh, how they operate within Britain, whose own position in Northern Ireland is not exactly based on a desire for consensus. But anyway, let's, let's leave that as it is. So, let's go back to democracy as a dysfunction sign. And bear in mind the, uh, the first level of signification here. So, as I have suggested earlier, when democratic discourse is reduced to a literal language, the possibility of interpretation is eliminated. Here I want to discuss what happens to the political imaginary when this happens. To illustrate my argument, I will use Roland Barthes' model of the relationship between a language object, being the first level of signification, and a meta-language, being the second level of signification. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. In his celebrated essay, Myth Today, Barthes explained that there are two semiological systems. A linguistic system, the language, which he calls language object, because it is the language which myth gets hold of, 
in order to build its own system and myth itself, which he calls meta-language because it is a second language in which one speaks about the first. And you would remember this one. Now, if we read the relationship between language and myth in the formation of our democratic imaginary, and by that I mean our understanding and practicing of democracy, the relationship between the meaning, the signified, of democracy as a universal suffrage in which we all participate by right and democracy is formed, the signifier as the liberty by which we exercise our equal right, we would then begin to understand how democracy is a sign upon which we agree and which we practice. Now, just sort of to clarify things, as you know, the first bit, signifier, signified, and then sign, and which then becomes signifier, that you could argue that that is the bit where the rose is red and the rose is just red. It's a rose, it's a flower, it's red. It's not a carnation, it's nothing else. However, once we have the red rose as a sign, at the second level of signification, the myth, it becomes a symbol of something else. So if I give someone a red rose on 14th February or any other time, I mean this is a token of love. If I raise the red rose with a fist on the 1st of May here in Europe, then basically you probably would assume that I'm making a political um, gesture and I'm talking about a certain kind of approach so to politics. So I'm a lefty in that case. Um, and that, that means that the signifier, or the rose is a sig at the second level of signification, becomes a, an empty signifier, as uh, Laclau likes to call, used to call it, or even a floating signifier. Because its meanings, its meanings begin to kind of you know, float, and they take different things. You could also talk about an empty signifier in terms of certain leaders, for example. I mean, in his book on populism, Populist Logic, and as Laclau talks about Peron, you know, him being Argentinian, he remembers Peron. And Peron used to be, if you're a socialist, you say Viva Peron. If you're a fascist, you say Viva Peron. It's the same thing, but actually, you know, that you're coming to the same leader from totally different perspectives, and, people, and that's where kind of populism comes in. And this is quite an interesting thing. But that operates, could operate only in, in, on the second level of signification. I'm mentioning this because um, this is very important for us to try to understand why on earth, if you take away the lie from um, the kind of whole assembly of our political and democratic discourse, then you have a problem. So, as a sign, okay, I don't know whether I read this. So let's look at this. As a meta-language, democracy travels on a hermeneutic horizon, where suffrage and liberty are not just processes, but forms of life. With democracy, a meta-language, suffrage, as a meta-language, suffrage and liberty gain plural meanings. And they inform a horizon of language games that sustain a plural world. This transforms democracy into plural event. Democracy sustains itself not simply on elections, but on how it becomes a way of life. And that, I think, is very important. Without these qualities, democracy remains a sign that is limited to the state of a language object. In the state, democracy is closed and has no chance of evolving, let alone sustain itself. As a meta-language, democracy is not just given legitimacy by the dynamic qualities of what stands on a literal level, but it gains full legitimacy by the multiplicity that characterizes society. So if you think about this, while liberty and suffrage, more or less, I mean, you could probably, we could kind of discuss this of what you put in there for a long time. I've been thinking about it for days of what should I put there, but I keep thinking, we're thinking about liberal democracy, we're talking about liberty, freedom to express ourselves, whatever, but also there's suffrage. If we don't all have universal suffrage, then there's no democracy. Those are the basic kind of tenets. Put them together, you get democracy on a very kind of, you know, it's all mechanism. But at that level, that's fine. But then at the second level, democracy itself becomes an empty signifier. And you could argue that democracy could become just a form of liberty. And we know this, especially in the West, particularly in America, Liberty becomes the shibboleth. But we have liberty, so it's everything. But no, so no, no, no. Hang on a minute. If democracy is just reduced to this kind of form of liberty, and that stage, it's also a negative form of liberty, which means, as Isaiah Berlin says, negative liberty basically means taking away all obstructions to liberty, uh, which is different from positive liberty, as you know, because that's more qualified by a social kind of context. Then you have a problem, because it, it, it kind of sits there. You need to then... It needs to be supplemented, it needs to be kind of on a second level of signification, that democracy takes a very different dynamic and starts meaning, having different meanings, and it becomes more diverse. So that's important. 
Now, in this sense, the demos is not just a paper. It is what Spinoza calls the multitude. The multitude. Uh, yes. <clears throat> I don't need to read that. I can read that. Democracy cannot be solely liberal. It must also become social. Democracy's historical development must evolve from its basic liberal democratic language into an emancipatory ground for social justice and equality into a commonwealth. A liberal democracy does not evolve into a social democracy. A liberal democracy that does not evolve into social democracy is bound to remain beholden to its imperial past. And by this I mean that doesn't mean that it becomes social democracy so it's faced to become a liberal democracy as well. But you have to have kind of, you know, two aspects of it. We know very well that in the name of empire, most liberal democracies exercised slavery, committed genocide, and oppressed those who resided outside the secure walls of the so-called motherland's democratic polis. If you think about how imperial France, Britain, even um, Netherlands, and all sorts of others, while they had the liberal democratic process there, they had liberals going all over the world talking about these kind of ideas. On the other hand, most of them were slave owners. There was the genocide of the Native Americans. There was the genocide of the Conquista in, Spain, in, uh, in Latin America. You name it. Yet, the liberal lie is sustained itself even when empire exported democracy on the same pretexts by which it imposed liberal and social democracies throughout the world. In the same way, it spread Christianity by the sword. Now, this contradiction is no virtue. So I'm not saying, look, you know, it works even if you do that. I'm not going into good and evil here. The contradiction is no virtue. However, though appearing to work against democracy itself, the full extent of the lie as a language game has, not without a paradox, sustained democracy. Without a dialectical understanding of democracy, the paradox of lying as a language game won't make sense at all. More so, there will be no place for any semiological understanding of democracy as it moves back and forth between its function as a language object and as a meta-language. In the gradual incapacity of democracy to move back and forth between its dual character of language object and the meta-language, one realizes how democracy becomes a dysfunctional sign. Political representation is disabled, while the agonistic and dialectical abilities of democracy to keep its language games in sight erodes away. That grammatically, such a state of affairs begins to look like this. It is what I am calling a society of myth, where democracy as a language object is alienated from democracy as a meta-language. As democracy is reduced to a formless sign, the demos, the people, is reduced to a term that is alienated from Spinoza's concept of, quote, the right of the commonwealth as determined by the power of the multitude. And let you can see how it works. So, I mean, basically, you could argue, and again, this is a very formulaic kind of um, diagram, but I'm hoping that it begins to kind of give us a notion of what's going on here. And how, when we talk about fake news, we're not talking about that, we're talking about something very, very different. Okay. So, more specifically, look, here I want to pause and briefly propose a different approach to lying via vis the law. To do so, I want to venture outside the liberal democratic tradition. And more specifically, I am citing the Judaic tradition, where the law emerges from a people in exile, which stands in deep contrast with the citizenry of a city-state, as we know with the Greeks. Now, as teachers, the rabbis were interpreters of a sacred text that houses the law itself. Their work is best preserved in the Talmud, where the law exudes a sense of community that is not tied to the actual city and its walls. Rather, it voices a people in exile yearning for its homeland. In the wilderness of exile, the Talmud is sustained by a dialectical engagement with the law as a mainstay of the people. As you know, the Talmud is very much based on a dialectic between all these rabbis talking about everything, just about everything you can imagine. Um, it's fascinating, actually. Now, the people of the Talmud is not a community which elects, but a people that regards itself as being elected, that is, chosen. The law is a covenant between the chosen people and the divine promise which the same people discerns from what it once transcended from its here and now. 
The two rabbinic citations which I opened, with which I opened this lecture focus on promising and witnessing. And I'm shifting emphasis here because it's interesting how you can kind of then start looking back at, at liberal democracy in a very different way. So, just to quote them, Rabbi Zira said, one must not promise to give something to a child and not give it to him. Because thereby he is taught to lie. And the teaching aspect here, the pedagogical aspect is very important. Shimon ben Shetah says, examine the witnesses thoroughly, but be careful how you express yourself so that they do not learn from you how to lie. <laughs> it's, it's an, I mean, so you learn how to lie from the sophisticated expression of witnessing, if you like, or how you teach others to witness. Now, if we read democracy through a discourse that it posed from such a radically different position, we get a perspective that reveals other details which in the liberal tradition we take for granted. To look at the language game of lying from a Talmudic approach to the law is to be challenged. I mean, when we look at it, one, we find ourselves being challenged by profound contrasts in the representational scheme of democratic signification itself. Rabbi Zira captures the notion, go back to Rabbi Zira here, captures the notion of an indirect pedagogy, where a lie is taught through a promise that is not kept. Shimon ben Shetah presents us with a scenario where an act of witnessing becomes an occasion for lying through one's expression. And the, 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 thing, the teaching, the thought, how we learn and also how we express is very important here. From the perspective of our political imaginary, these two scenarios of lying present us with the dynamic of living together through acts of promising and the witnessing of the law as a dialectical expression of living together. Here I'm citing these scenarios from the Talmud for two reasons. The first is methodological, um, by which actually we try to kind of look at it from a different perspective, and the second relates to edification. In a methodological sense, I am looking for a language of law that resides outside the Greco-Roman legal narratives and traditions which, from liberal democratic discourse, owes its evolution. In contrast, by edification, I want to bring in what Richard Rorty attributes to a number of philosophers whose aim, in his words, is to edify, that is, to help their readers or society as a whole break free from outworn vocabularies and attitudes rather than to provide grounding for the institutions and customs of the present. And here I, I, you know, I show my colors because basically what I'm also looking for is a way of looking at these things without being foundational in any way possible. So even liberalism can't be foundational in this case. Methodologically speaking, the Talmudic rabbis help us discern and understand whether, and if so how, the elimination of the language game of lying leaves democracy wide open to the challenges that remain inherent to the democratic promise that we make to each other and the witnessing by which the law is expressed. I would remind you that in its social and liberal aspirations, democracy has historically acted as a cover for an enclosure that sponsors discrimination poverty and exclusion domestically, while beyond its walls, democratic governance never stopped from actively sustaining a bellicose global economy as an expedient sponsor of highly dubious regimes. If it wasn't Saddam Hussein in the past, it is currently the Saudis. And they were not the enemies, but they were the friends to whom we sent all the, you know, the weaponry. When I say we, it's not us, obviously. In Malta, we don't do that stuff. So, to be more specific, on the domestic front, within democratic polis, we have an increasing section of the population which Jacques Rancière calls the part of no part, part de sans part. This includes large numbers of undocumented people, refugees, and a widening section of minorities who may have limited rights, but in effect are left out of the democratic life entirely. And this is a bit like the Greeks. No? In terms of foreign politics, I mean, you remember, in the Greek polis, actually, not everyone had the rights. So there were people who were within there, but they didn't have any rights. I mean, you were a woman, you were a slave, you were proletarian. That means a group of people who were just, just there to make kids. And also, you were a foreigner, especially, you were not a citizen, so you didn't have... So, I mean, this whole idea of a democracy, which as well have these other people who are not part of it, is, 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 is interesting, to say the least. But also, it's very worrying in terms of how we have managed to legitimize that kind of situation. In terms of foreign politics, we are witnessing a new turn in belligerent meddling. 
a heightened activity in arms sales and technology, and an increasing number of wars fought by proxy. In the name of liberal and social democracy, entire parts of the world are contained, as we have seen in the Middle East, where we get news of one genocide after another and misaccusations from all sides. The irony is that all this is still done in the name of liberal democracy, whose communicative lie continues to, lie, to fail to function, especially when the aim is to sustain a society of myth back home, which lost its capacity to discern a lie from another. Simply because, as Adorno put it over 50 years ago, nobody believes anybody, everyone is in the know. Clearly, both the promising and witnessing of democracy have become entangled in their own rules. By not being given what is promised by democracy, the people have learned to lie. Likewise, as we continue to learn how we remain witness to the law, our forms of expression have gradually suppressed the multiplicity of language games by which we originally learned how to lie about our lying. The consequence is that the lie neutered itself and democracy lost its metalinguistic anchorage. Those who, like myself, have spent time figuring out how to facilitate a sustained pedagogical engagement with the work of a philosopher like Friedrich Nietzsche know that the attraction is found in a pedagogical impossibility, just the same as studio pedagogy, where the key word is that of unlearning. To engage with Nietzsche and other philosophers like him implies that such a paradox must be embraced. Nietzsche never meant to build a system that would adapt. In fact, he continuously urged his readers to unlearn all those epistemological expectations by which they have been encouraged to act like a herd instead of a multitude. So as one embraces his defying philosophy, one cannot be blamed for wondering, as I often do, why did we get at this stage, even when philosophers like Nietzsche, Gadamer, Rorty, Vattimo have amply warned us of these consequences. Indeed, why do we still invest our hopes in a groundedness that deludes us? Why have we beatified our existence with an assumed truthfulness which leaves us bereft of our historical contingency? Now, just to recall the opening chapter of Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche alerts his readers of the dangers of a moralizing entrapment that leaves them without any recourse to a hermeneutic right to interpretation. Philosophers and essayists some three decades Three decades, Nietzsche Sr., like, for example, Kierkegaard, Thoreau, and before them, Emerson, have all relayed this paradox. More recently, this was conveyed by James, by Dewey, Cavell, and especially by Rorty, who pushed philosophy into the sphere of what is akin to the craft, the techni, of the poets and the artists. To quote Nietzsche, these philosophers have taken charge of a dangerous perhaps. Rorty took this dangerous perhaps further into philosophy's edifying qualities, this is a sense of edification which, not without irony, grew from a serious anguish over the fallacy of a ground in an effort to free us from what Dewey once called the superstition of necessity. And if you haven't read that essay, I would strongly recommend it because it's found these days free through on the internet. But it's a fascinating essay which he wrote way back, um, I think in the third, it was not even in the other century. Anyway. Philosophy's edification affords no comfort in superstition. Before one thinks that edification is a poetic way to cut corners from the rigor of philosophical thinking, one needs to rethink one's own priorities. Rigor does not occupy a comfortable system that fits the positivistic expectations by which education has been consigned to a knowledge or creative industry. Rather, as Nietzsche states in Schopenhauer as educator, the secret of all education is that it does not lend artificial limbs, wax noses, or spectacled eyes. Rather, what can give these things is only the afterimage of education. When democracy becomes semiotically dysfunctional, the language game of lying becomes an afterimage. What is posed as fake news are those artificial limbs, wax noses, and spectacled eyes epitomized by the clownery of politicians who want to amuse us by their own self-proclaimed genius. You remember the stable genius? <laughs> As an afterimage, the lie resembles those claimed apparitions of beatified souls in whose dehumanized state they could only offer us the consolation of nonsensical ritual. The cult that emerges from these apparitions takes all directions, to the left, to the right, and the center. Yet this cult continues to push democracy into a politics of immediacy and short-termism, 
that are sustained by a deluded state of accountability, and more so a media-savvy narrative which only convinces those who are already predisposed to be persuaded. This is where I would say, this is the afterimage, is where qualunquismo uh, flourishes. So, while some would argue that description is just an occasion for a quick surmising of political relativism that rejects the old ways of ideology, I would hasten to argue the contrary. It is a myth to assume that the centrist politicians who have prevailed are simply pragmatists and anti-ideological. It is even more a false, very false to argue that democracy has succumbed to some post-Marxist or some post-modernist, let alone post-humanist advent, where the ground is being challenged by a new crop of enlightened leaders. In many ways, a market-driven polity is now reaping its logical consequences. We know very well that there is no secret in a reason for all this. There is no political essence or infrastructure, as some Marxists used to call it, from which we can simply retrieve a solution. Substitution of democracy with a society of myth, as inaugurated, as inaugurated by the beatification of lying, is neither pragmatic nor edifying. Being, as it were, split between its re refined bureaucratic structure and its claims to deliver a plethora of civil rights, the process by which the beatified lying of current democracy is structured also affords to secure what Walter Benjamin once described as a centerpiece of fascist representation, where the masses are given the right to express themselves, but no right to property or real power. And he said this in the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. So, I think I'm going to conclude now, so we only have two pages. <laughs> the free expression of the masses is most effective because on a closer look it is evidently stuck in its state of immediacy. It is emblematic of how the practice of lying deceives itself. The validation of lying no longer comes from a language game learned from other language games, but in how a lie is able to lie about itself. In the context of the political imaginary, the language games by which we have learned how to lie were meant to sustain fairness, especially at times when we realized that democracy was flawed by its own limitations. But at the same time, democracy was the only horizon on which we could struggle for equality and social justice. It is a well-known fact that liberal democracy is flawed, but it is also true to say that democracy remains the only horizon on which we could wage our struggle for freedom and social justice. This is where I am with Dewey and where I would cite his social democratic pragmatism as one of those viable tools within which the philosophical imaginary by which we need to keep the basis of liberal and social democracies alive, even and especially when we know very well that there are more than just shortcomings to the democratic project. So, by way of conclusion, I will pose a number of questions. Now, given that the language game of lying is lost with the eclipsing of, polit of the political, is the struggle for social justice and equality still possible within democratic imaginary as it stands? Is it at all possible to restore the precarious paradox on which democracies have run, even when flawed by their sponsorship of all manners of injustice and strife? If not, what does this mean to those who would still claim, and I'm one of such radical democrats, that democracy is to be found in the contingencies by which we could still return the ground into a horizon where conviviality could, at the very best, return to the discourse of viable possibilities. It seems to me that the problem is in how we continue to insist on an answer. The way we could go about such a problem is to examine the question itself. And perhaps, as Nietzsche once suggested, we realize that sometimes, in our obsession with the fallacy of truth, we have become complicit with the Sphinx, whose questions we choose to answer only to avoid certain perdition. Is it any wonder, asks Nietzsche, if we finally become suspicious, lose patience, turn impatiently away, that we ourselves are also learning from the Sphinx to pose questions? Who is it really that questions us here? What in us really wills the truth? My guess is that upon insisting on the presumptive truth that we thought would help us survive the curse of the Sphinx, we lost interest in the language game of lying. Yet, as we kept telling ourselves that we are the custodians of the truth, our lies began to deceive us. Knowingly, we continue to lie to ourselves and each other, while we are no longer ready to believe anything that we say. What is even more terrifying is that we know very well that no matter how much we go out to protest and denounce our favorite opponents of being deceitful, 
we are always conscious that we are only deluding ourselves with our claim to behold the truth. All too quickly, we attribute deceit to those whom we hate. Yet hardly do we realize that in hating and rejecting our opponents, we are systematically detesting and hating ourselves. It is at this point of mutual hatred, at the point where political debate becomes impossible, that we can say with absolute certainty that fascism has taken over our political imaginary. Thank you. I think Professor Baldekin has given us quite a substantial amount of food for thought. So now we can have a run of questions about the topic discussed this evening, and there will be a roaming microphone so that anyone who would like to put a question um, can, can do that. I think there is already one question at the back and another question. Thank you for your great presentation. I really enjoyed it. I do have, although obviously um, since democracy is about disagreement, I do have some perplexity, especially with your last strong statement about hatred, which taken from different traditions, like even Thomas Aquinas, for example, the idea of hatred is part of a passion that kind of is also related to love and stuff like that. But on the other hand, um, I do feel that maybe the crisis that we are living is more related to um, indifference, it's more related to alienation, it's more related to not feeling any passions than actually, in my opinion, towards hatred. And this is, for example, very much present within the Holocaust literature, that actually what brought to the Holocaust is the bystander more than actually the passion against or the um, antagonism. So that was one question. The other question is, in a way, also related um, to this, is kind of where would you place the notion of authenticity in this kind of um, presentation? Is authenticity truth, or we are talking about something even more than truth? And, uh, and that is for me is a little bit like I'm I was trying to fit the notion of authenticity within this. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, I mean, I definitely agree with you that, um, again, like, like the lie, if we're talking about hatred, you have to contextualize it within this kind of um, you know, possibility of hatred, qualav and all that stuff. I mean, I was also talking about, I remember once I did the presentation, I talked about the right to anger, which is very important. But this is the problem, that when you have a situation where the multiplicity of all these, let's call them language games for life, forms of life, are, is being actually suppressed because um, of... of of how I kind of you know try to explain that, then all these these things don't don't function anymore. And in a way, we need to be very careful. I mean, you were talking about just before we started the whole idea of inclusion, for example, where you know in education we do that a lot. But I mean, especially in dealing with with the arts, we we tend to look at things inside out. And if you start talking, and I always find that I have an irritating kind of I get irritated by people keep talking about emancipation as if this is some kind of shibboleth that is going to happen because in a way we are in a situation now where if you're going to talk about um, inclusion you basically are saying we include those who we want to include and leave everything everyone out and we're still stuck within a walled polis so this whole idea of anything that we say even though it makes sense including authenticity is being subverted by the fact that it's already being conditioned by certain forms that are already there influencing kind of you know as I said, hauling out democracy, that leaves us with an inability to be able to communicate. So, I mean, while I do agree with you in what you're saying and in the words, we also know that those words have become kind of, you know, taken away. I mean, there's an essay, I can't remember what it's called, but I mean, there's a big, one of the small books which Dewey wrote in the, um, in the 30s, and we, he says exactly how people talk liberalism, they use exactly the same terms as liberalism, classically, sort of, and you know, when Dewey talks about liberalism, he's also being quite a social democrat in a way. And, but actually, these words end up doing the opposite, partly because the condition that they've become framed in um, have kind of meant. And he says that the reason why we don't, we're not attentive to that and we don't realize what's happening is that we don't 
recognize the historic relativity within which meaning emerges. So strictly speaking, if you say autonomy, if you say heteronomy, if you say authenticity or fallacy, they mean something, but in the, in the, in the, in the structure by which, in the historic relativity by which they kind of operate, they're starting to mean the opposite, and they have been doing that for a long, long time. And the 1930s are important because, I mean, you know, as we know, we keep talking whether we're kind of mirroring that kind of situation. But it is a situation where liberalism was really at a crisis, and it was left with, with a kind of sort of almost like a hollowed out situation. And that allowed anti-politics, allowed fascism, allowed all sorts of reactionary things to move in. And it became easier for people to use these words without actually understanding the historicity and the historical relativity of it. So, in a way, as you know, especially dealing with philosophy, we need to deal also with the practice of this kind of relativized context. Now, that doesn't make me a relativist, but I mean, these are very important to, uh, it's very important to keep that in mind. Otherwise, we become absolutists, and that's the problem that we have held on to, this kind of foundationalism, which is now being used by people, various... Uh, politicians on all sides to basically throw it at us and we, 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 we become helpless, we don't know what to do with it because we want to hold on to principles but actually these principles are all out so how do you do that? Do we reinvent the stuff or do we renegotiate? Do we unlearn more than learning? That's, that's the biggest challenge I think. Hi, good evening. It was a very lovely and thorough talk. Thanks. Um, you mentioned before, at the very the first quarter of your speech, you mentioned that happen happenstances like Brexit and the Trump administration, they are um, utilizing the democratic, the democratic system to throw out the democratic semiotics. And I was wondering whether um, you find that, or you can see that, as the first step towards democratic backsliding. Hmm. Yeah, because I mean, it's, it's that kind of typical situation where the form and the, uh, the essence, if you like, and I don't want to use the word in an ideal sense, they kind of, you know, they're separated out partly because they are relativized in a certain way that, that this allows us to see it historically. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about what referendums, whether referendums should be kind of valid, but I mean, beyond that. But also now, if you think about Brexit, there is this whole dis discussion whether Parliament ultimately were sovereignty and how, how does it inform the... Now, I mean, I don't want to go into the situation where you say people, because they're not informed, they vote the wrong way. And as I said here, I made sure that I wanted to kind of explain this. I'm not against the fact that the vote went the wrong... For me, it went the other way I wanted it to go. But it's what the consequences of that came up. It's the aftermath of it which is really worrying. It's not the vote. That's fine. Happened like that, fine. But I mean, the fact that there is an incapacity of the, the, the two camps to be able to kind of get together and try to kind of find, you know, a way out of this, a synthesis, if you like, um, which then is open-ended and it kind of allows us to, to, to have a working um, relation, is, is problematic. Because democracy, that means that democracy becomes just a form, an empty signifier, and nothing else. And we're not even allowing that the, the swarm of interpretations, the, 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 the other language games and everything, they still play a role in it. But the lying is interesting there, because you could say against what I'm arguing, that was all lies. But it wasn't, because normally what I'm meaning by a language game of lying is also a language game of, of all sorts of other possibilities. But I mean, there wasn't, I mean, we, I, mean I was there following it, uh, kind of became feverish. But I mean, you could see that they were not talking to each other, they were talking kind of, you know, at, at, at cross, you know. And, and there was no dialogue, and the people couldn't really understand what was going on. Doesn't mean that people were stupid, they couldn't vote, but actually, the debate was not there at all. So, I mean, the, the, the whole problem started from the beginning rather than the result. The result is what it is. And with Trump, it's the same thing because, I mean, the whole thing has developed in a certain way that, um, you know, the rules of the game were not there. He, he would refuse them. 
and everything. And it became actually an, a numeric anomaly. I mean, even when you think about it, it actually he didn't even get the majority of votes. So even if you go by a simplistic argument of who gets the majority of votes, he did it. But then you can argue, you know, that it's an outdated. But we also know there's a lot of gerrymandering. If you think about certain states, a New York um, vote for the Democrats actually means is equivalent to less votes in terms of college, you know, the college, then say um, a vote for, for the Republicans and another. So there is, there is also the, the whole game itself is, is really flawed. Again, one was expecting it. There were a lot of people, especially who, who regard this as the presidency. Let's take it away from the person, as mostly did with George Bush, for example, which is a good example. There was a close, agree, and also not everyone started to love George Bush, but on the other hand, Democracy functioned in some way or another. You could always tell me there was the war in Iraq, but that's the, the dilemma of liberal democracy anyway. But in this case, it doesn't function anymore. So, I mean, we have a very unique situation. And if we start having, like Italy, for example, if you think about it, the first republic in Italy, which used to be looked like dysfunctional, and incidentally, I think today is one of the, the anniversary of the, the, the killing of Aldo Moro in the context of the Compromiso Storico, that's an important one. How the second republic in Italy totally doesn't function. It's, it's really interesting how you can argue that there were the lies as a language game in the first one, and in the second one, there isn't even that. There isn't even that, there's nothing. So, well, maybe. I don't know. I'm just thinking about it. So. Hi, John. Uh, Hi. Two points. One, regarding the contents, and the other, boring, boringly exegetic. The first one, I mean, you seem to be implying that democracy functions if the two sides are somehow talking to each other, the two sides who are sort of uh, engage directly in the political arena. Honestly, I have problems with that, and I can cite a historic example. I mean, in, uh, in Malta prior to World War II, the two sides of the political spec spectrum, uh, they were talking to each other. They were talking to each other to the exclusion of the people, because their main issue was whether Italian or English should be the main uh, the language, the national language, but most people have the most important things to do. I think that ultimately is very much, I mean, problematic and uh, as a consequence it will generate. Probably it's the same thing with the, I don't know, mainstream politicians today. They do talk to each other, but the problem is that the way in which they talk to each other, their engagement, is by definition anti democratic in the sense that it excludes the demos, first thing. The other thing, as I said, is not related to the content. Uh, you refer to, it's more specific to if it can change the thesis. You refer to lying as a language game. Now, obviously, there is that passage where he does refer to lying as a language game, but I think it's a very unfortunate passage in the sense that, I mean, to my mind, language game is lying is more a speech act, which can happen in a number of uh, language games. Indeed, I mean, especially in uncertainty, uh, he seems to presume that to engage in a language game, one must take as uh, true or truthful certain assumptions and the like. So, honestly, I have some exegetical words about it. Yeah, but that's why I, I, that's why I uh, well, I use uh, <laughs> academic rigor uh, in order to be able to kind of, you know, I did also mention services agreement with, with, with Wittgenstein. And also I did, my position with that is more intent on the notion of, of the learned aspect of language games rather than anything else. So exegetically you might be right, but I mean I'm taking it further from, from the Wittgensteinian um, situation. Partly because what I'm interested in more is the whole idea of the multiplicity and how language games in and of themselves evolve and change because they're forms of life. The other issue that you mentioned, I am not sure, I might be historically wrong, but as far as I know, if you think about democracy as just being a form in terms of suffrage and liberty, I'm not sure the context that you mentioned historically was exactly there. And also the whole issue of communication, which excluded people out, that means that there was no democracy there in, in as such. And also there was a colonial context, which was very, very problematic. So, I mean, democracy in Malta under colonial rule was, as the historians would tell me, very different in terms of what I'm talking about here. Uh, and it's also rep rep replete with, with, um, with paradoxes and contradictions. So I'm not sure whether that context would fit in. Obviously, we are talking in terms of not ideals, but we're talking about kind of you know models by which we can approximate something. But I mean, here there are no models as such. So I mean, strictly speaking, I'm using the model in order to be able to try to understand how lying could function within democracy. 
The other thing is, unless the demos becomes a multitude, there's also another. So, I mean, I'm bringing in a whole string of conditions in this in order to be able to kind of articulate it. But definitely, if suddenly we become pickish and, and the, the multiplicity of expressions, call them whatever you like, and the, the, the aspects, of all aspects of how this kind of plurality of how we approach to us as forms of associated living, not only as democracy, but also as a convivial form of democracy, then we have a problem. And this is where probably, because we were not very careful with that and just assumed that liberal democracy could look after itself, now we're in a very, very, very difficult sort of situation. It has happened before, but I think this one is even more different. It's much more different than the 1930s. It's not just you know we keep talking about fascism coming back, but I mean when I mean fascism is more of a representational understanding of the world, which may not be jackpots and uh, salutes or whatever, but it could really de deteriorate. And we're seeing this happening um, with the erosion of rights in certain sm rights which look kind of they're not universal but much more smaller. But also the, the, the disparate relationship, the, the kind of the, the, the disconnect between what we have in law, and this especially includes more Europe than, than, than probably not to say, where on law we have all these rights and we have all these liberties and whatever, but actually in, in, on the ground we don't have that because our democracy is still excluding. We have the part of no parts in there, as Rancière calls it, a huge number of populations within it. We're still walled within a polis. And if we don't kind of bridge the walls and deal with the notion of, board, of how we understand those, those kind of parameters of democracy. We're not going to get anywhere. Which is why, historically, the European Union was created and why we're still having that. But I mean, those, those kinds of discussions are, are have becoming more and more academic, so to speak, and, uh, and less, less grounded and less practical. Thank you for your interesting lecture. Um, your Definition of lie as uh, language game. Ah. You're hiding. Uh, original, I've never heard it before. Uh, but the definition I was familiar with was by Adrienne Rich in her book on lying, what uh, really means and the alchemy of human possibility. She says, um, she says, there is nothing simple or easy about the idea of truth. There is no dead truth or a truth. Truth is not one thing or even a system. It is an increasing complexity. Uh, the pattern of uh, the carpet is a surface. When we look closely or when we become weavers, we learn of the tiny multiple uh, threads unseen in the overall patterns, the knots of the other side of, of the carpet. This is why the effort to speak honestly is important. Lies are usually attempts to make everything simpler for the liar than it really is or ought to be. And in that regard, since in neoliberal system everything is a commodity, so everything functions uh, whether uh, or how easily it can be sold for profit, uh, complexity cannot compete with simplicity and the complexity doesn't sell well. So yeah. the way we learn about the world uh, through media or through social media, we do not see complexity anymore. So neoliberalism in a way functions against the truth. Yeah. So what do you think about it? I, I, I agree. I mean, when you were talking about and you're quoting that, it reminded me of, um, as I said, you know, the whole idea of the reifying of the lie. That, that betrays my interest in... Uh, <laughs> and my background in George Lukács. And the whole idea of how everything, in, when, when George Lukács talks about how everything becomes reified in a context by which then the reification allows us to think on levels of immediacy and where mediation is thrown out uh, on the pretext that it simply kind of is grounded in an absolute. But obviously his dialectical thinking knows that that doesn't work like that. That's where the complexity comes in, but where actually even in uh, my own profession and in the universities where everything is becoming more and more accountable in terms of, of metrics, we're having a problem because, you know, the, I, mean, I mean, I'm in a field, Kenneth will tell you this and others who work in, in, in our field, where we have been struggling against positivism all our lives. And, uh, but even now, 
um, you know, even if you're talking about simply kind of supervising a dissertation, you could have someone who tell you what is this methodology and they don't accept it. Now, in my field, in terms of the arts, actually, we are pushing back in terms of, 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 of a methodological uh, or notion of, of, of complexity, which has to do with, with our practice, with the studio, with the whole idea of a space, with the whole idea of unlearning, with the whole idea of... And that is really pushed back all the time, pushed back. And because the reason is that, as you say, everything becomes commodified and then the lie itself and everything else, all the forms of life, like all the languages, become commodified because the immediacy is what, what comes. So even education itself has become kind of, you know, a list of things. There's a hierarchy of, of it becomes an epistemology in the sense of these kind of, and the gnosiological side of knowledge is gone. The whole idea of, of being, the whole idea of the complexity of it, and the, so, so this is, I totally agree with you that, that that's, that's where the, um, where you want to call it dialectic, you want to call it rapport, you want to call it whatever you like, is, is, and I find myself really irritated by people who keep talking about simplicity, and I mean, we, you face that more kind of um, concretely in, in the Anglo-American context. Although, having said, and this is why I mentioned Rorty, you have also pushbacks with people from Rorty and others who are actually, you know, saying, no, 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 that doesn't work. But that's why he talks about edification rather than other things. So this is why I kind of wanted to bring in these, these, um, these actors, if you like, these, these, these aspects of uh, philosophical thinking, because it allows us to at least try to move out of this, the scourge of, of, of the immediate. As you say, so definitely, I, I totally agree. Um, my, my point to really relates to the point that has just been made about um, the language game. Um, when you were talking, I, I couldn't tell. You know, all the time thinking about um, Habermas and um, uh, his um, representation of an ideal speech. Not as an, as an actuality, but as a kind of standard. And uh, the idea is speech situation that constitute, constitutes democracy from this point of view uh, eliminates pathologies. And lying is represented as a kind of a pathology. So, well, I mean, would it be more useful um, from a pragmatic and democratic point of view to regard lying as a pathology within the language game of truth, rather than you know, than, uh, as, as, a, as a language game in itself, uh, where by truth, obviously, I am not referring to uh, some kind of notion of truth that's correspondence with anything with facts, but I'm thinking of truth in terms of candor, you know, of honesty, of being able to, you know, truth in those senses of the word. Um, well, anyway. I, 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 yeah, I, I see that, and, but I mean, what, maybe probably I was too, I'm too enamored by, by Adorno's notion of the honest lie, which became kind of, you know, one of the linchpins on this thing. But I mean, the whole, yeah, and, and it's the paradox of it. But also you could argue that, that truth, as you describe it, is, forms, or is, is constructed by, or whatever, sustains a whole multiplicity of language games, including the lie. So I mean, I singled out the lie here, but I'm not saying this is the exclusive one. But also, I think the whole idea of contingency in this in this context and how we, we keep place, you know, some try to keep it away, is is problematic, and we, we are not even kind of you know educated in in the idea of of the contingent, and I find that really problematic because we're still being kind of even when we talk about truth, that's always being excluded, and I like I personally find you know the kind of latter ends of the the, the arguments on contingency, both in uh, people like Heller. But also in royalty, which are very different. But on the other hand, that kind of you know how they how they come together is intriguing. I don't know. I might be wrong, but I mean, even within the legitimation process that Habermas talks about, I I think he does take into consideration these the contingency as as part of, and that's how the legitimacy is gained by actually taking functioning for or at court against it, not against it as in contrary to, but in relationship to it. But I might be confusing one thing with the other. Then. I do do admit that uh, my Habermas is not as good as yours. <laughs> but yeah, definitely, I, I like, I mean, I think there is, there is a lot of uh, possibilities in terms of taking that further. So I hope this is just an opening kind of uh, parting shot in trying to understand how, how this could function. But surely the whole idea of how we are hooked on this idea that the lie is evil 
And the good and evil situation is, is something which we need to kind of move beyond that, because politically we're really stuck. Yeah. It is a yeah. It is yes. I mean, whether you want to call it yeah. Mm, maybe. <laughs> Uh, well, there is this definitely a fabular aspect to it. So it is; these are narratives which we, we, we kind of thrive on. And But those myths are going, and that's the problem, is that we need to keep them. Whether we call them lies, myths, or whatever, yeah, definitely. But I like the qualification in terms of the myth that you say, so definitely. Yes. <coughs> uh, thanks, Professor Valdacchino, for being with us, and for the very well research. So, uh, I think that the story of lying, uh, truth, things which are not true, things that we don't know whether they are true or not, has been a bit confused in philosophy. And this probably resulted in modern times from the idea of the liar's paradox. Where people argue that, that, in my opinion, they confuse issues about between something which is not true and something which is a lie. Now, to discuss such a complex thing as democracy and another complex concept like lying, I think one has to go to some type of operational definitions. And I would say that lying contains an element of intentionality where the truth has already been discovered and then the truth is being manipulated usually in an evil way to deceive. That is very important because we must not confuse as if we confuse as Aristotle has, um, has remarked, we, we always live in what is apparently true to us, although it's not true. And even the virus paradox actually underlies a discovery of a higher type of truth. So the story of truth is something which is rich in philosophy, and must not be confused with this idea of lying. So this is an important uh, fact we need to know, in my opinion. The other uh, thing that I noticed in, in, in your speech, but then you gathered everything and I was relieved, it's very difficult again to reduce. It's a category mistake that most philosophers do and people. We can't say democracy equals lying. Because there are so many other things that happen in democracy. And again, what other types of governments are open to us if we denounce democracy? But I must not be wrong. The third um, uh, observation, and this is, comes uh, more as a question to you, is the metaphysics of your talk where you put a lot of importance even in your write-up between the idea of relativity and the idea of the dialectic. For me, relativity is always a subset of the dialectic because relativity is dialectic, the dialectic is triadic. Well, there were and how, so therefore, how would you use this metaphysics this meta language of relativity and um, the dialectic to explain your thoughts about two phenomena. Because honestly, when when Wittgenstein says lying is a, a game, he didn't say much because for him all language was games, so he didn't help much in defining lying. So I think it's very important to put um, some more sort of explanations on 
to what your position is, especially in this idea of relativity and the dynamic, uh, how, how they fit in, in your approach. Thank you so much. Thanks. Now, there are two things which probably we disagree on. The first one is to do with the first um, assumption you made, not assumption, but you, the first um, statement you made about lying. I know where you're coming from, and, we, and this is why I mentioned the, that this is not dwell, dwelling with that particular question. Partly because I think um, that becomes problematic, partly because I don't recognize my, I don't recognize the lie as just being a form of deception. Now, obviously, that, that puts me in a different position from yours, uh, both metaphysically and also in terms of how we, we engage with philosophy. Um, the other issue of operationality is I, I hope that I did explain the operationality in terms of what, what I was um, kind of in, in the paper, because that was something which I was very much aware of in terms of how the operationality of democracy um, is explained. And my notion of an operationality of democracy is probably different from what you explain in terms of saying, I hope I did actually you know, give definitions of what I mean by democracy myself. And this is where, especially the whole idea of the multitude, which comes not just from Spinoza, obviously, but I mean how it's developed in people like Negri and others, is important, particularly because the multitude does allow an open-endedness to, to, to the way we engage with each other, particularly, more importantly, convivially, rather than just in a way of associated living, which brings me to the idea of, of the relative when I was talking about it. And I, say, I did say, actually, that the lie has been relativized in the, in the abstract. Um, but we then need to kind of assert the, the, uh, the dialectic. Again, with the dialectic, I don't think the dialectic is triadic. I know that there, there is, a, you know, obviously. But the big problem with the dialectic is that the tri triadic notion of a dialectic is that we are inhabiting a space which is pre-Galilean. Pre and to that effect, the, the notion of space that we inhabit and we put the dialectic still is problematic in terms of how the dialectic then does not function for us. And we know that the, the, the whole idea of trying to kind of resolve the dialectic in and of itself has been a catastrophe in, in politics, as well as in other things. The, the, um, the issue of relationality as different from relativity is important, and I try to explain it by citing Dewey, partly because there is also the, historic, the historical aspect of it in terms of how things shift and change pragmatically, and how, therefore, if we're talking about the lie or we're talking about everything, we cannot therefore say that the lie, and I recognize what you're saying, especially when St. Augustine talks about a lie in a certain absolutist form, is that I don't think that functions for, at least, for the purpose of my essay. Uh, um, in, in another context, then that, that would be, I'm not throwing it out, I'm saying that that would have been a different essay if I did that. And in fact, to be honest, I started off with that kind of, with those kind of premises, but then I found out that they were not functioning for me in order to be able to understand or engage with the possibility, which is open-ended here, uh, of how you engage with the phenomenon of lying. And as I said, you know, with, um, Kenneth asked me the question, I am open to, to other possibilities here. In, in terms of how to do that. The, the issue of Wittgenstein and calling it language game, I mean, the, I mean it, it's, it's appeared that I was emphasizing it too much, but for me it, it is a kind of, you know, it is an opportunity and an occasion to be able to then just take it further. So probably if I were to rewrite this, I wouldn't make so much emphasis on the, on the language game in as much as I would make an emphasis on the multiplicity of expressions and life forms or whatever you want to call them. But I think the crux here is how this mechanism has left us bereft of, of myth by which we then could actually converge even in our differences. We've become so, I mean, we've reduced, we've reduced the notion of democracy so much to the first level of signification that we have lost the ability to be able to, come to, 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 to even disagree about democracy, let alone agree about it. And that's the big problem that we're having politically is that we have renounced on the ability to work within the language of myth to be able then to explore, negotiate, keep it open-ended, dig the whole idea of democracy. And I mean, to me, democracy is not, is not closed. It's, it's always going to, to evolve, and it is sustained. But if you take away the multitude, also if you take away the vested interest and class and all the other issues that, that keep, keep coming in, I mean, we tend to kind of think that, say, for example, the, the racial issues are just, just an American phenomenon or this or that, but we know that there's more than that. There's something which is really... The whole issue, for example, of misogyny and the whole patriarchalism that is emerging, the whole idea of the Me Too movement, 
I mean, these things, we cannot simply reduce them to, this is just PC going mad. No, it's not. We have had histories within which, actually, these have become so much accepted that we accept, you know, the, the oppression of women, we accept the oppression, um, racial discrimination, that but as long as we can talk about liberal democracy, this kind of, you know, abstract notion of good and evil and whatever, that it pushes me and others, and many others, to, to think about this in a totally different way. We need to start back and go back to these realities that have, at the end of the day, the success of capitalism in America was based on the fact that it was slavery, and then when there were the liberation of the slaves, actually most of them found themselves in prison in the South, and actually they had to, do, to give free labor. So, I mean, I know this sounds unphilosophical, but at the end of the day, if we don't, grab, if we don't engage philosophy on this kind of horizon, we're going to end up repeating the same lies, if you want to use them, but in a bad way. So, while we hold on to the myth, while we hold on to the ideals, on the other hand, we shouldn't be succumbed to the ideals as if they were absolute. But we need also to kind of, so keeping that in mind. It's a very difficult task, it's a very complex issue, but we have tended to renounce on that. We're renouncing on it in, in, a, in, a, in a culture of immediacy which we're finding in terms of communication and in terms of all sorts of other things. So, I mean, but hopefully, um, as we, we try to kind of, you know, accept the fact that we have this, this disconnect, Hopefully, we try to kind of think about it in a slightly different way. But definitely, I do appreciate what you're saying, and definitely I would engage, I am engaging with you in a very, and I find that very useful, because I think we do also keep, have to keep in mind those things, otherwise we wouldn't be able to communicate with each other. So, I mean, I don't exclude one in favor of the other, but I do think that we need also to look at this in, uh, in a much more comprehensive way. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you once again, Mr. Valentino. Um, we would like to invite you now for some drinks um, at the back of the hall. And I would like to remind us uh, outside the hall on the table there are some issues of the magazine share which the Philosophy Sharing Foundation publishes more or less every three months. So thank you very much. And uh, we would like now you to socialize and continue discussing uh, over some drinks. Thank you very much. Good evening.